Now, we're going to be talking about some of the things that are going on in Iran right now, which are quite phenomenal. But I want to get your story. So we're going to go back now to the late 70s. And a lot of us of my age group would remember the Islamic Revolution in Iran. Uh, the Shah was deposed. The Ayatollah Khomeini came in. And there were the, the chants on the streets of Tehran, death to America. And you were one of them. Of course, I was a young student uh, in Iran. I was getting my bachelor's degree. I had a dream of coming to the United States, get my PhD, be a research scientist. But yes, I was on the streets of Tehran like many, many other young people. We wanted change. We wanted to kick out the Shah and bring a nice, beautiful, utopian democracy. That was our ideal. That's why I was on the streets of Tehran, 79, shouting, death to America, death to America. By the way, yeah, I've changed my mind since then. I was blessed and I, I sing God bless America right now. <laughs> so you were able to go to the University of Southern California, great university in the United States, and uh, you were seeking your education, researcher, artificial intelligence. Tell me about your time there. Well, yeah, I was a student and I was achieving my dream of uh, getting a, a PhD. And then I, I could see I, uh, my future was looked, looked bright, you know, uh, getting a degree, finding a good job. But uh, I felt empty in my heart. And uh, where, where is God? How come I'm, I'm aimless? W what does it mean? I, I get a degree, uh, I probably find a good job, get a house, get a car, get a bigger house, a better car, and then you die. So what's the purpose of life? And then he said, wow, look, Islam. Islam is taking over the world. God is with Islam. And I should dedicate my life to serving Islam. But being an intellectual, I said, but I need to study to see what I'm committing to. Even though I knew a lot about Islam, I took a Quran. I studied it objectively for the first time, objectively. And when I finished, I said, I don't know. Where is God? It didn't touch my heart. It didn't change my life. Okay, I'm open-minded. So I'm going to read other books they say God has written. Bible. Okay. Out of my pride, right, yeah. I said, I'm going to read the Bible. And that's where... Uh, I encountered Jesus and a few months of just struggle and crisis in my faith happened. And at the end, I realized Jesus is the way and he's the savior. Yeah. So somewhere along the line there. So you, you're approaching this, you know, from a researcher perspective, you're going to read the Bible in three months, but then you never get past Matthew five and you started in Matthew. But when was it that you went from kind of the scientist and to faith, because there's a lot of people watching today saying, well, you have to kind of jump on, you know, jump out into the oblivion to become, you know, a Christian and that faith is just something you feel. Very good question. Uh, I had that trouble too. I didn't accept the faith that easily. I'm very intellectual, number one, an engineer type. I look for things that work. Nice poetry. Yeah. Okay. That's beautiful. That's why I looked at Sermon on the Mount. I did not like it. He said, these are beautiful. Oh, yeah, beautiful. But I'm not looking for poetry. I'm looking for something that works in my life, yeah. works around the world. And these words and Sermon on the Mount, it's not going to work. It's uh, Nobody can do them. So that's uh, why I uh, approached it with doubt. Uh, I studied the prophecies. I studied what the principle of uh, Christianity is what is Jesus really saying and does that work? That was the key phrase for me. Does that work? And when I realized the simple message of the gospel that even a child can understand has so much power that changes me, saved my family and can change nations. That's why I committed to it. Seeing the result, making sense to my mind. Yeah, and, and you write about it in your book, Iran's Great Awakening, how God is using a Muslim convert to spark revival, that your marriage was in trouble. And even though you had materially a lot of things going for you, a great job, family and that, but there was that need there. And so when did you decide that, OK, this is not just something intellectual and it's more than just nice poetry and stories, but this is something that would change your life? Well, I had uh, I was comparing Islam and Christianity, Quran and the Bible, and had many questions. 
and unanswered questions. And for somebody like me, that's torture. You have to get the bottom of it. You can't keep, you know, get things hanging in the air. What is the truth? I can't just continue my life. Which one is true? Both cannot be true. Some people say, oh, all religions are the same. And if you study them, they all converge. They're all about the same. And when I studied Quran and the Bible, they did not, they're not the same. And I couldn't bring them together. So that's why I went to a church and that's where I heard the simple message of the gospel. Uh, uh, what I realized is that I was making gospel very complicated. Hmm. Gospel is simple, but powerful. That's what moved me. Now, you had a significant event that, that obviously would affect anybody. Your 16-year-old brother uh, had a minor political uh, charge against him, and he was put in prison, and he was executed. How did that affect you, and how did that, you, you had to wrestle with God through that? Yes, that uh, was a turning point for me uh, in my spiritual life. I was a new believer. I was praying for my younger brother. He was a uh, 16-year-old when he, they arrested him. They kept him for two years, and when he turned 18, they called my mom and said, come and get his body. We just executed him, firing squad. And by the way, my mom had to pay money to get his body back, pay for the killing of her son. But uh, for three days, I was mourning. I was asking God, okay, uh, what is this? There's injustice in the world. What am I supposed to do as a Christian? Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to take revenge. I'm going to take revenge. Then I realized, oh, God says, revenge is mine. You're not supposed to do that. Okay, I, I hate them, God. I hate those people who killed my brother. Oh, I'm not supposed to hate I'm supposed to even love my enemies. Well, what kind of faith is this that I got into? Okay, I'm angry. Oh yeah, I remember. I, I'm not supposed to be angry, even in my heart. So I say, God, can I at least cuss <laughs> so I can feel better? I, I said, no, no, no bad words. No bad, because you worship with your mouth. You cannot uh, blaspheme in, in, with your mouth. So I went and said, God, what can I do? And I heard this in my heart, in my spirit, that those people who killed your brother, they are not your enemies. They are victims in the hands of your enemies. When you look at those Muslim killing others, don't look at their, them as enemies. They are victims. We have to love them. We have to share the gospel. Another thing happened was a call in my life. I said, God, okay. And, and God said, if you want to hurt the enemy, which is Satan, what should you do? What can I do, Lord? Share the gospel, because every one person that comes to Christ, there is a rejoicing in heaven. We know that, but there is a mourning in the courts of hell in Satan. So I dedicated my life in evangelism, even though I was a very engineer type, introvert, shy person. I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to share the gospel. And I asked God, would you use my life to bring one million Muslims to Christ? I didn't know what I was asking. It was just came. I had no idea how it could happen. I just was a desire in my heart. Yeah, it, it's a phenomenal story. And I mean, so you leave your your good job, uh, you go into ministry and you're pastoring and uh, they, there were some rough times. There. Again, you can read more about this in uh, Hermosa's book. But then this calling uh, to reach into Iran in the Middle East, uh, Ar Iran Alive Ministries is what you are working with now, satellite television, internet, uh, a thousand churches or more have been planted in, high, in over a hundred cities in Iran. And her most things are incredible. When you look at the growth rate of the church in Iran, it is the fastest in the world in spite of persecution, in spite of oppression. What's going on there? There is a amazing breakthrough spiritually in Iran. Iranians by millions have rejected Islam and they're very open to the gospel. How do you get there? You cannot have a church. If even you have a host church, you get arrested, you get five to 10 years for just having a church in your home. So the best way for this time is media. We use satellite television to go over the heads of the mullahs into people's homes. We share the gospel and they are ready. Their hearts are ready. Jesus appears to them in visions, dreams, and miracles. Jesus has proven himself to, the, to them. And when they watch our programs with the simplest message, 
they come to Christ. We just uh, started a new uh, wave of evangelism a few months ago, and two weeks ago, we celebrated 10,000 salvations. And these are the people who contacted us. It's dangerous to contact us. Yeah. It's, uh, we are blocked. It's hard to contact us. So there, by millions, Iranians are open to the gospel. It doesn't mean they become Christian. We have to do our part. Jesus has done his part, died on the cross, loves them, opens their heart, but he has asked us to share the gospel, do our part. And my challenge is, do you love Muslims? Because God loves Muslims. And do you want them to be saved? Because God wants them to be saved. And he uses you and me to share the gospel. So this is a historical time to turn an Islamic nation to a Christian nation. And Iran is going to influence not just the Middle East, too, but the whole world. I like my friends in Iran. That was the best part. And of course, my family. Who? We haven't even started and I'm still like so emotional. <laughs> um, I started when I was nine. The city that I was in, in Iran called Esmahan. It's a really religious city. It was like so hard for girls. We are so worried that you cannot gonna come back home or something gonna happen to you or the government should do something to you. My Quran teacher came to the class and told me about heaven and hell. As a girl, you should not color your nails and you should not have a long nails and um, God would like tear them out. And even I knew as a nine years old, I'm going to make a mistake. And I remember as a kid imagining that that was like so scary and like terrifying. I was like, you know what? I don't want to talk to God. I don't want to deal with this. I just want to live this life happily and make good decision. I said goodbye to him and I was feeling so good the next day. I was like, yay! Because of the situation in Iran, my parents decided for me to just leave the country, which was the best decision, but I didn't realize it back in the time. So I went to Cyprus, uh, which my older sister and her husband used to live there too. They were refugees at that time, so I knew how hard it is to be a refugee. And I couldn't do any study because I didn't have any visa or anything like that. I couldn't drive. Basically, you don't have any identity. It was so hard. But they had like so much peace and hope in their life. And they like, they were like, oh, we're gonna figure it out. God's gonna open the door. I was like, you guys are so relaxed. Like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> and they were Christian and I didn't know anything about Christ. Like, I didn't even hear his name. That's totally new. And we went to church. So many people, they talk in Farsi, they worshiping God in Farsi, they dance, they sing for God. Are you kidding? Dress nice, nails are long, colored on their nails. And I was like, wow. And I started reading Bible and I couldn't put my Bible down. He's not a mad, angry God who created me, but he's mad at me. He's not that. He created me with so much love and so much passion. He's excited about my life. He doesn't, he even create colors. He gave me the eyes to see the colors. So there is nothing wrong in coloring my nails or showing off my hair that he gave me. My sister keeps saying that God is a father. He's loving you. He's amazing he's gonna provide for you and all of that and it was like if he's a father i want to meet that father i want to see what kind of father he is they had a really good father he passed away when i was 19. and um, jesus himself he deal with every single thing that i am going through he was a refugee he was hated and he understand me. That understanding, it was like a, such a huge thing for me. One day at the church, I was like, I'm so ready. I'm so ready to accept this. I'm so ready to welcome God to my life. And I cannot wait to see his purpose for my life.